Welcome to the Richard Roper Show. Thanks to everyone, as always, for tuning in. We are at the end of the summer movie season, kind of the summer TV season as well. Uh, lots of great stuff coming up in the fall. I'm also going to talk about releases that are coming out right now or are already available on streaming or good old-fashioned go-to-the-movies type of a deal. Also, some bunch of different entertainment-related and pop culture related stories I want to talk to you guys about. And it's Labor Day weekend. I know a lot of folks have Labor Day. Not everybody has Labor Day, but if you have time off. But we're also going to talk about some movies that are particularly appropriate for watching over the Labor Day weekend. Not necessarily movies about the labor movement, but movies about the workplace, because that's what Labor Day is all about, celebrating the worker, all of you, no matter where you are. In these United States or across the planet, you hard-working bastards, you. Got some movies for you guys to uh, to check out if you haven't seen them already or to rewatch. All of that and much, much more. But first, The Richard Roper Show is brought to you by AmericanEagle.com Studios. The digital landscape is changing rapidly. And to compete in today's online business environment, you know what you need. You need an experienced partner. Since 1995, AmericanEagle.com has partnered with companies of all sizes, offering web design, web development, e-commerce, mobile apps, and digital marketing to drive your overall business's success because they believe that today's online world is your online opportunity. Visit AmericanEagle.com to get started today. All right. Uh, as I'm speaking to y'all, it's the very end of August and the... Uh, SAG after strike continues. Uh, Los Angeles Times had a recent report. One of the writers and actors strikes going to end. That's the questions on the mind. That is the question on the minds of everyone in the entertainment industry. As the summer of labor unrest looks likely to stretch well into the fall and possibly the holiday season. Now, the consequences of this disagreement, this very serious disagreement, this strike are becoming clearer by the day. Uh, it was recently announced that uh, Dune Part 2, which was going to come out in November, and I really enjoyed the first one, and they really set it up for uh, a rousing, spectacular, visually striking, uh, beautiful and haunting second part. Uh, it was going to come out November 3rd, now coming out March 15th. Uh, the deal there, folks, is if they were going to have it come out on November 3rd, Dune Part 2 uh, stars uh, Timothy Chalamet, Zendaya, Rebecca Ferguson, a lot of other big and big names and familiar faces. Uh, they were not going to be able to do any promotion whatsoever. That's part of the agreement of the strike that actors are not doing any promotional work. You'll notice that you're not seeing those usual junket type interviews, even for stuff that's come out because actors are not doing that. I can tell you from my standpoint, I'm getting pitched a lot of interviews with um, showrunners, yeah, you know, people on the producer side of things. Uh, for various TV shows and movies, but uh, I don't know of a single major star who's doing any promotional work. They can do film festival stuff. There are certain exceptions, but the feeling here with Dune Part 2 is that if you don't have your Zendaya and your Timothy Chalamet out there promoting it, uh, you might lose some business, even though this is an established franchise and the first movie did very well. Uh, this means also that if it were to be nominated for Academy Awards, I think it will certainly in a lot of the technical categories and maybe even for best picture, that would be for the following year now because it's not going to be in the calendar year where it would be eligible. Another thing we should mention, you would normally see these stars, of course, on the late night talk show circuit, but Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy Fallon, uh, Colbert, Seth Meyers, all of them uh, are also on hiatus because their shows, even though they're talk shows, uh, there's, you know, they have staffs of writers, you know, the monologues and bits and everything. So they're also on hiatus. In fact, all those guys are now doing a, a podcast, all the late night hosts, and they're going to donate all the proceeds to, uh, to the union to help out their staffers, which is very cool. So that's where we're at right now. Other things have been pushed back. Uh, the Marvel anti-hero uh, picture, Craven the Hunter, uh, the Ghostbusters sequel, uh, the movie uh, Challengers from MGM Amazon coming out now in April. Ethan Cohn's film, Drive Away Dolls, scheduled for February. So we're starting to see some of these films get pushed back. What you're also going to see uh, in the very, very near future, guys, in the next couple of weeks, actually, you're starting to see a little bit of it trickling already on your standard broadcast television. You're not going to get new seasons of shows because they were all shut down 
months ago. So, for example, something like Abbott Elementary or the, the Chicago show, Chicago PD, Chicago Fire, etc. So you're going to see more game shows. You're going to see more uh, reality, uh, unscripted TV. We got the senior bachelor. Have you seen the senior bachelor? He's scary good looking. Of course, they, you know, the senior bachelor, he's some dude from Indiana, but he looks like the, a clone of Paul Newman. So they're going to have senior bachelor and all this kind of stuff. You know, they got to fill the slots with something. You're going to be dancing with all kinds of stars and you're going to be surviving all different kinds of ways and bachelorizing, but no scripted stuff. And the ripple effect will be felt for the next few years to come, even if this thing gets settled because everything got shut down. People I've talked to who work in the business still feel like they can settle this thing by maybe November. Most scripted series. Now, the writers, you got to remember, they have not been writing. That's the way it's supposed to work. Nobody's supposed to be writing during the writer's strike. So they would have to start writing stuff. Uh, so, for example, if, if a, a streaming series, a big hit series, for example, The Bear, they're going to do a season three. They finished season two in time. Season two has been out there and got, it's going to get a million Emmy nominations next time around. Uh, but season three even though the showrunners have an idea of where it's going to go, they'd have to sit down and actually write, you know, eight or 10 or 12 episodes before they even think about getting into production. And I know even for kind of the shows that have been around a long time, the more standard, if you will, broadcast shows, again, like the Chicago uh, PD and Chicago Fire type shows, the Dick Wolf Productions, uh, he said, or the, his team has said that the day the strike ends, they would need at least eight weeks to gear up again, because not only do you have to write scripts, but you got to get people to fly in. You got to get crews set up. You got to get locations, catering, all of that stuff has to be put in place. So it, it's going to be a while still far apart, but uh, at some point they're going to fix this because everybody's losing money right now. All right. This story has been around for a few days, uh, but I still wanted to, to circle back to it. That's what people like to say these days. Let's circle. I'm gently circling back. Gentle reminder. I like when I get emails. Gently circling back. I like when people gently circle back. I feel like they're a, a friendly bird coming back to pitch something again. As I, Although it'd be kind of fun if somebody just eventually said, I'm aggressively circling back. I am an eagle. I am a hawk. I'm a falcon. Come to take you away. But I'm gently circling back to this story. You might have seen something about this. Uh, Adele is one of the many uh, pop stars who was doing these Las Vegas residency shows. Now, these have been around, guys, for a very, very long time. If you saw the Elvis movie, you might recall, you know, Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, got him into this deal, a hotel residency deal. This is, we're talking 50 years ago, that was horrible, a horrible deal. Uh, it's one of the reasons why Elvis never played overseas ever. He was chained to these contracts. Now, a lot of the residencies over the years have been wonderful. I I know some artists. I know two people in particular who have done residencies, and they love it because as much as uh, they love touring, the idea of just being in one place, staying in a you know a beautiful bungalow at the Bellagio or a or a house off the Strip. And then doing a, a, a two-hour show every night. That's what they usually do. It's, it's a concert, but it's, it's not as long usually as the, the big stadium shows they do. Uh, they don't have to worry about, you know, moving equipment around. The lighting is there. The sound is there. In a lot of cases, there are uh, specially made videos that accompany the, the show. So they love doing these residencies. So everybody, you know, Elton John does a residency. Springsteen, you name it. So Adele's doing a residency at the Coliseum at Caesars Palace which is a really cool uh, spot. I think it's saw Elton John do his residency there about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and you might have heard this crazy fan in the front row who had a selfie stick, which, by the way, I didn't even know there were any of those around. I thought they had been uh, outlawed in 2009, but he had a, a selfie stick, and he was an over-the-top fan, and he kept standing up and, and, and going crazy, and fans and then security told him, can you sit down? You're kind of you know making this all about you. And then finally Adele stopped the show and actually told security to leave the guy alone. Why are you bothering him? Don't tell anyone to sit down. And said he's enjoying the show. Leave him alone. That's the, that's the deal. Hey, great, great for the fan. Okay. I have kind of mixed feelings about this. Uh, the fan in question posted a video talking about how he had been looking forward to this for his whole life. And it was the moment of his lifetime. And uh, he doesn't care, basically, if he bothered anybody else. And a lot of people are responding the same way, saying, hey, it's a concert, man. Get off your asses. Get up and dance and, and go crazy. And, you know, that's kind of true. If you're at a concert, go nuts. I mean, I've been to a million shows. And, you know, there are certain moments in certain concerts where everybody kind of sits down because it's going to be an acoustic number or a ballad. 
and then everybody gets back up. There are certain concerts where people are so excited they never sit down. And you kind of go, okay, well, if everybody's going to stand, I'll stand as well. I don't have any problem with that. Stay in your space, I would say. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm more bothered, honestly, by people that think that they're in concert. And again, you want to sing along with the song, sing along with the song. But sometimes they sing so loudly, I can't hear the artist. But again, you're going to a concert, you kind of know this shit's going to happen. I think this kid was way over the top with his selfie stick and standing up and getting in people's way. How much does this fan love Adele? So much that he seemed to be in an Adele-induced trance, recording himself with a selfie stick at one of the singer's recent Las Vegas concerts. He was gently scolded for standing, blocking the view of others, and then, two seconds after she left, even Adele noticed from the stage, as security quietly tried to get him to tone it down, Adele stopped the show mid-song. What is going on with that young fan there? He's been bothered so much since I came on for standing up. What's going on with him? Yes, you with a stick in your hand. You can stand up now, darling. You can stand up. Oh, 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 oh. Even security seemed insecure when admonished by Adele. What are you doing? Why are you out bothering him? Can you leave him alone, please? Yes, you don't you have to do. sit down. You're fine. Stay right here. His reactions are are insane. I mean, I, I, you look at it and you go, well, what else is missing from your life that you're that excited to the point uh, like a child would be excited over getting an ice cream cone? He's not a child. He's a grown man. He's a young man, but still, you know, to me, it's like I, I don't understand anybody getting that excited over a pop star. Even though Adele's great. You know, it's cool to see her and everything, but so over the top. He was a distraction. So my feeling is like there's probably a happy medium here if this dude wants to get up. I think the selfie stick. And, I, you know, listen, Adele was all for it because a lot of artists we know would be like, okay, dude, really, with the selfie stick the whole time, you're making it about you. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't behind the guy, but I also feel like listen, if someone's standing up at a concert is bothering you, you might be past your concert going years. It's one of the reasons I, I selectively attend concerts. I know if I go to certain concerts, it's going to be a cluster F and I'm probably not going to have a great time. And it's not even necessarily the age of the performer. It's just the, you know, the, the venue. If you're going to Lollapalooza, it's Lollapalooza, man. You know, and if you go to an acoustic show, it's different. So uh, I just, I just feel like so many people, including this TikTok guy who, you know, posted his thing saying, I have every right to go crazy. I just think so many people want to make the viewing experience, the going to the sporting venue, the football game, the concert, the stand-up show. They want to make it about themselves. And it's like, I think, you know, have a good time. Go a little crazy. But remember, people are not paying to see your ass. All right, moving on. As I mentioned, in honor of Labor Day, some of my favorite movies about the workforce. And again, uh, I'm not talking about movies about the labor movement, uh, although there, there are, of course, a lot of great movies. Norma Ray is one movie that people talk about all the time. Uh, Hoffa, which is a very stylized and uh, fictionalized uh, biopic. We've talked about you know, biographies that are that stray way from reality. Uh, but I think it's a pretty great film, actually. And and I thought Nicholson was great. But yeah, there, I mean, there's the Danny DeVito character is completely fictional in that movie. Uh, most of the scenarios are, including the, their conjecture about what happened to Jimmy Hoffa. But that's a great film about labor. Uh, believe it or not, Sylvester Stallone did a movie called Fist, One Fist, F-I-S-D. I think it was about truckers unions. It came out, you know, in between Rockies. Stallone was doing, trying to do uh, prestige projects like Fist. He did a film called Paradise Alley for which he sang the title theme, which if you give a listen to, good luck to your ears. I kind of like Fist, Silkwood, a lot of films out there, even going back to, you know, Grapes of Wrath that are about, you know, overcoming the man. But I want to talk more about uh, workplace movies, workforce movies. Uh, starting off, these are just some of my favorites, not all of them, guys, but Office Space from 1999. I recently rewatched it. It's a There's a reason why people still quote it and still do stapler, you know, bits and uh, imitate Gary Cole's boss saying he's going to need you to mm, come in on uh, Saturday. 
And why don't you go ahead and come in on Sunday? It's very funny. It's had, it's very subversive. The cast is terrific. So that's a good one to revisit. Here's a workplace film that I don't know if people immediately think of this as workplace. Because they think workplace, they think of offices, warehouses. But Clerks is a workplace movie, right? The first Clerks, 1994, all of them. But the whole thing is basically with a you know a few side trips is set. At the at the at the Quick Stop groceries, uh, and again, really good stuff. Kevin Smith uh, has is still to be commended to this day for coming up with that and figuring out a way to shoot it, and it, it's very funny, very dark. Uh, Clerks, uh, another dark movie that is not funny at all, and I don't think this came out uh, right at the start. I think of the pandemic, so there was a little bit of like, is it going to be on, you know, available on home video and theaters, but there was a movie in 2019 called the assistant and that stars, uh, Julia Garner, you know, her from Ozark. And again, is a fictional film, but she is the new assistant to uh, a studio had who was unseen by the way, he's heard the voice on the phone, which is a brilliant way. As we know, some of the scariest monsters, some of the worst monsters in movie history are the ones that we almost never see or just rarely see. And he's clearly playing a Harvey Weinstein type. And uh, she's working for this company where it's just horrible sexism and misogyny and harassment. And uh, it's really, really good performance by uh, Julia Garner. Also, uh, the company's head of HR is played by Matthew McFadden, you know him as Tom on Succession, and he's essentially playing, if Tom on Succession had the job as head of uh, HR for a company and he was purely a company man, he would be this guy, total slime ball, who acts as if he's helping her, but is actually compounding the problem. Really good stuff. Let's make it official and call it a complaint. Let's assume I were to do the service of writing it up for you. So your complaint is as follows. The company hires a new assistant, she's young, and in your opinion, she's very pretty, and she's maybe a little she's inexperienced. A exactly. She's a They've possibly offered her a job, just like that, and they're putting her up in a fancy hotel. And you live, where do you live? Astoria. Astoria? <laughs> okay, I understand. That's not the point. And by the way, how experienced were you when you got hired? A couple of internships, am I right? The last one paid me. Do you know, do you know how many people work at this company? I have to make sure all of them are taken care of. And you know how many people want to work here? I've got 400 resumes teed up for your position alone. Ivy League grads, 4.0 GPAs. And here you are sitting in my office, stressed out, jealous of some new assistant who's, who's getting more attention than you. Another workplace film that I love, 2002, Barbershop. Barbershop is one of those all, almost all, you know, everything taking place in one setting. Again, there's some other scenes, but uh, Ice Cube is Calvin, who has decided that, um, you know, it's time to move on and sell the barbershop, but then all these amazing and funny and moving things happen in the workplace. Working Girl from 1988 with Melanie Griffith, not a film that holds up completely under uh, the prism of, uh, you know, 30 plus years, but really well done and great performance uh, by Melanie Griffith and, of course, uh, Harrison Ford. And Two Week Notice, Two Weeks Notice from 2002. That's another good workplace film uh, with Hugh Grant and Sandra Bullock. And uh, talking about other uh, really good workplace films, some very serious, some more comedic. My short list, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, Wall Street, Spotlight, one of the great workplace movies about a newsroom, the Boston Globe's newsroom and how work, things work there. Up in the Air, which is about a workplace that is mainly uh, on the road for George Clooney, of course, but still a workplace film. Uh, the Devil Wears Prada, The Devil Wears Prada, of course, The Wolf of Wall Street. Big, big is a workplace film because remember, uh, he's working at a toy company. And you can go all the way back to The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit from 1956, if you haven't seen that film. A terrific workplace film. When we think about uh, workplace uh, efforts, too, TV shows, uh, even more so than films, rely on that. Uh, that's a great foundation, a great formula. That's the way to get a bunch of different people in one space, which for sitcoms, it works really well because they, you, don't, you don't have to build so many sets, right? You have one primary set, and then once in, a, once in a while, the action will go elsewhere. So it's an economic decision. It's a dramatic, a comedic decision. And you put a bunch of people together who normally wouldn't spend a lot of time with each other. You know, you look at something like Friends or even Seinfeld, they are choosing to be friends. They are choosing to spend time with each other. 
And in both cases, those comedies would occasionally go into workplace situations. But they are really about uh, the home lives, the uh, off-duty lives with Seinfeld. Well, both of them half the time, I don't know if they had jobs. Uh, but the workplace comedies, we're talking about, again, just some of my favorites. The Office. Everybody going into Dunder Mifflin. Cheers with the bar. Superstore. Abbott Elementary. The Bear with the restaurant. Parks and Recreation is a classic example. Taxi. The Mary Tyler Moore Show. 30 Rock. On and on it goes. So just a lot of great TV shows and movies as well about working. All right. Let's take a break and talk about Portillo's. And then we're going to come back with a few reviews for you. All right, let's talk a little bit about Portillo's. They're known, of course, for their famous Chicago hot dogs with all the freshest and tastiest ingredients, right down to that famous poppy seed bun. Then we have to talk about the legendary chocolate cake. And everybody knows if you've ever been to Portillo's, but if you don't, you never put the cake in the fridge. You have to have it at room temperature. That's how it's delivered to you or handed to you in the restaurant. That's the way you have to taste it. And of course, the menu has everything from the char-broiled burger to Italian beef, to some really good chopped salads. But, oh, that chocolate cake, I'm telling you. Now, there are locations throughout the Midwest and in Florida, California, and Arizona. But you can also ship Portillo's anywhere in the United States of America by ordering at portillos.com. That's P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S.com. P-O-R-T-I-L-L-O-S.com. Someone killed my son. I need to. We've got to leave, but I don't think that's what you should be thinking about right now, Mom. I love Michael, and I'm sad he's gone. I'm pregnant. I'm here to help, but you need to talk to other people in your situation. You are my best writer, right? You know I didn't make him a junkie. No, I don't know that. Is he still feeling? That's the thing he had stopped. Somebody called him that night. He left all freaked up. And then bam. Who's that? That's about $50,000 worth of dirty heroin. You saw the person who broke in? Don't make any sense. We got a lead. A what? We got a lead. I don't know what's best. Okay, that's a little audio snippet from The Good Mother. This is a 2023 release, not to be confused with the 1998 Diane Keaton movie, which called, was also called The Good Mother, or the 2013 TV movie, which was called The Good Mother, uh, or the Darren Aronofsky film that was called Mother, or the 2023 uh, thriller with Jennifer Lopez called Mother. This is The Good Mother 2023. This stars two-time Academy Award winner Hilary Swank, it's uh, set in Albany, and I like that fact, set in upstate New York, Albany, New York, because you haven't seen a ton of movies set there, and you can tell they filmed on location. This is one of those deals where Toronto or Atlanta is filling in for Albany, so it has kind of a, a gritty, blue collar, uh, in some cases, uh, kind of darker side of the city look to it. So it's it's a good-looking film. Obviously, with Hilary Swank, you've got really good performances. It's very disappointing, though, guys, because this is a movie where the cliches just come in hot and fast, and they stay for the whole movie. The setup here is that Hilary Swank is playing a journalist, a print journalist for the Albany Times Union, uh, kind of a cliche journalist. The first time we see her, she's waking up, of course, next to a bottle. She's a hard-drinking journalist. She swigs some mouthwash and then goes into work where her editor is talking about how People are trying to get clickbaits, and let's not forget about what real journalism is all about, and we've seen all of that before. She plays a, a, a widow with two grown sons. One is a cop, and one is a drug addict who, unfortunately, early in the story, uh, tragically is gunned down. So now uh, Hillary Swank's character of Marissa becomes an, an investigative journalist, a detective, right, investigating her own son's death. She partners up uh, with Olivia Cook's Paige, who is the pregnant girlfriend of her deceased son. So this kind of unlikely pairing. Uh, you know, the problem with this is it, it's, an, it's certainly a dark and gritty and authentic premise. Uh, very real world of today. The son is, gets, gets mixed up with a particularly uh, lethal form of fentanyl. But 
the way this film is done, the way it's constructed about halfway through, a certain character makes a shocking discovery and then behaves in a way that nobody in their right mind would behave. Behaves in a way that make uh, the victims in horror movies look like improv geniuses. And you never really recover from a, a, a huge plot stumble like that in a film like this that, the you know, it's supposed to be an elegantly constructed jigsaw puzzle, a murder mystery, a thriller where we're going to see things in flashback and we're going to learn certain truths about characters. And the other problem with it, there's such an economy of characters, and this happens in a lot of films where there's only a certain number of characters. It's not an Agatha Christie mystery, so it's kind of obvious early on who the real villain is. I won't spoil it if you want to check it out, but if you don't give us other possibilities, there's only one way that things can go, and uh, that's what happens with The Good Mother. Disappointed in that one. Here's one that I kind of loved, guys, and it's currently on Netflix. It's doing very well. No surprise. It's got the Adam Sandler brand. It's called You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah. I'm not popular. What is happening? You look insane. Slay queen. I'm not a loser. One day, and the gold bar will be mine, and you will have a cool boyfriend too, and then we'll have a droning loss in Tribeca. In Taylor Swift's building. Yeah. Oh my God. Can you just let me explain, please? No, let me explain to you. We are no longer friends. Yo, shit just got real. <laughs> What's the matter? Something bugging you? She betrayed me. She kissed my crush, and then he touched her on her boob and pee. A, B, C, D, E, F, U. Oh, I under boob. Hey, I got plenty of that. I know what she needs, because I know how she's feeling. She needs to process this herself. I know she hurt you, but I'm sure she misses her best friend. I'm going to take that as a maybe. I'm so... I've put Adam Sandler's films into two categories over the last, you know, Three decades, really. There's the AGT films. I call them the Adam's Got Talent films that showcase his real ability. He's got a real charisma, an actual, and we know this by now. If you haven't, if you, if you just dismiss Adam Sandler as a one joke uh, note uh, of a performer, you're not paying attention because going all the way back to Punch Drunk Love, Spanglish, Rain Over Me, The Cobbler, The Meyerowitz Stories, recent films like Uncut Gems and Hustle, really good work. I mean, there was Oscar talk, nomination talk for Uncut Gems, and it was merited. And then, of course, we have the cargo shorts and flip-flop films, as I call them, where Adam just wears his cargo shorts and his flip-flops and his baggy shirts, like his wardrobe is essentially whatever he grabbed out of his own closet. And some of them are really funny, and, and he's just going for big, dumb laughs. That goes all the way, of course, back to Billy Madison and Happy Gilmore. And then films like more recent things like Grown Ups and Murder Mystery and and stuff like that, you know, hit or miss. Some of them are really, really funny and people love uh, those early ones in particular. Um, you Are So Not Invited to My Bot Mitzvah would fit into the second category. He's playing an authentic character. It's not an Adam Sandler vehicle. He's actually uh, the dad of a 13-year-old girl who's going through all sorts of middle school hijinks in the buildup to her bot mitzvah. And we get Adam Sandler's two daughters playing the two daughters in this. Uh, Sonny Sandler plays the lead, Stacey Friedman. And then um, uh, Sadie Sandler is the older sister. And then his uh, his wife, Adam's wife, plays the mother of, of, of Stacey's best friend. A little bit convoluted there and complicated but essentially Adam Sandler's the dad and his two daughters play his daughters and his wife plays the wife of somebody else uh the daughters listen did they get the role is it what they what do they call them nepo babies which is so ridiculous because every field ever has people whose children get certain breaks and then they have to come through they're both really good it's charming it's funny it's very much in the you know the, the vein of coming of age comedies we've been seeing for 30 or 40 years but I love the fact that it is very uh specific to the culture, to the faith, uh, to the buildup, to the bat mitzvah. It's a film that is about a Jewish family and, and a Jewish, a, a sacred and, and important uh, rite. And I love that. Uh, you know, I can set, tell you this as a, as a guy who's, you know, raised Roman Catholic, we've seen a lot of movies about Christianity, especially Christmas movies, but it's really cool. This is one of the few movies I think I've seen that's all about a bat mitzvah. And I love that, but it's also very universal. It's about two best friends who go through so much together and spoiler alert, they might even wind up reconciling all their differences.
So you are so not welcome to my bat mitzvah. Really well done. Uh, at a completely different vein, I want to mention uh, finally here, the A&E documentary series, Secrets of Penthouse. Now, you might recall we talked a few years ago about Secrets of Playboy, an A&E limited documentary series that was so popular and very polarizing and controversial because it really went after and a lot of former uh, Playboy employees and playmates really went after uh, Hugh Hefner and talked about alleged uh, improprieties at the Playboy Mansion and the culture. And then a lot of people who also worked for Hugh Hefner and were Playboy playmates and worked at the Playboy Club and were executives there standing up for the late Hugh Hefner saying that's not the Hugh Hefner I knew. He was a benevolent figure. So that debate keeps raging on. And the series is so popular. They now have 20 episodes of that, two seasons of The Secrets of Playboy. So now comes The Secrets of Penthouse. Penthouse, the most successful magazine in the history of publishing. The dirtiest magazine in America. It's one of the richest men in the world. There was so much money. But Bob Guccione died penniless. What the hell happened? My father was manipulative. He was a serial predator. The dark, satanic prince of sex. I can't photograph a girl that doesn't excite me. Same shot again, right? He was 50. We were teenagers. 18, 19. He had this power and control. You put the girls on birth control pills. He wanted us in an orgy. How he abused me is against the law. All that money just disappeared. He wrecked it. Even family members will try to usurp you. He was the emperor in his own kingdom who could do no wrong. That was his downfall. Secrets of Penthouse, two-night event, premieres Labor Day at 9, only on a &E. Now, if you don't know, Penthouse Magazine came along in the 60s as the racier, more graphic uh, counterpart rival to Playboy. Penthouse was the first one to say we're going to do full frontal nudity and all that stuff. And Bob Guccione was this character. And again, kind of uh, positioned himself as the uh, more or overtly sexual, not so particularly, he kind of wanted to be known as cultured as well. But, you know, he had the open neck shirt and the 12 medallions hanging there. And he had this voice like, I'm Bob Guccione. And the penthouse pets were called pets, which proves there's even a more demeaning term than Playboy Playmate. And he went after uh, Playboy. He also did the same thing Playboy did. He'd get, like, well-known writers and stuff like that. And they'd branch out into other media. But I have to say, watching this documentary, I wasn't so sure I needed to see a four-part series about penthouse. It's actually really fascinating. Uh, I did not realize that at one point, uh, Penthouse was the most successful magazine in the history of publishing, that Bob Guccione was worth upward of $400 million. He built the largest uh, single residency in New York City. I think it might still be the most expensive. It recently went for something like $80 million. He built this huge townhouse on the Upper East Side of Manhattan and filled it with artwork from Picasso, Picasso and Chagall and Van Gogh and Matisse. Uh, but what's also fascinating, it's very much like Succession in that uh, his grown children, in particular, uh, one one daughter has passed away, and the other four, two of them participated in the documentary, two didn't, but it's three sons and one daughter, just like Succession, and they all tried their whole lives to please their distant father, just like in Succession, and he would take turns picking favorites, and then eventually shun each and every one of them to the point that some of them didn't talk to him for decades. So it's this kind of American tragedy. And then Guccione got into all this other stuff again, wanting to be this, you know, cause ego narcissism. He, he builds, he puts $145 million into a casino in Atlantic city without ever getting a license. And Donald Trump of all people tells him they're never going to give a, a casino license to the publisher of penthouse. And in this case, Trump was actually right. So that was a debacle hotels. He did this movie called Caligula. You can look it up. One of the biggest debacles, one of the biggest bombs in movie history, because it was a sexually explicit film that also wanted to be a prestige film. So it had Helen Mirren and John Gilgood and Malcolm McDowell. And it was just horrible. And eventually it all came crumbling down to the point that Bob Guccione lost everything, including his magazine, his townhouse, wound up in a small house in New Jersey that I think he had bought for his mother. Uh, and just was this broken man. So it's kind of, you know, a, a, a sleazy Citizen Kane, if you will. But fascinating stuff. It's called Secrets of Penthouse. It's on A&E. 
let's wrap it up right there, guys. Thanks so much for listening. If you're having the holiday weekend, be safe. And we'll talk again real soon.